what we have here is a very thick 390 that I can't seem to keep run. Now it won't start. One thing I can tell you is there's plenty of gas to the carburetor, so it's not a fuel starvation issue. It smells like gas too, it's not a diesel issue. I've seen that before. You know, and pretty much every time you have a issue like that where it's not going to run or won't run low RPMs, nine times out of ten it's an air leak. I can't even get it to build vacuum of any kind. It sounds like it's underneath here. It's probably the boot. Yeah, I can sometimes hear with this where it's coming from. It's either the boot, which is what it is 90% of the time. Or it blew out a section of the base gasket, one or the other. This is a Husqvarna shop tool. It's pretty handy. I built my own block for the exhaust, you know. I just took some flat stock that I had gotten from tractor supply and drilled some holes in it. That's all I use, you know. And I just use like, the screws right from the muffler. So let's just take it right out of there and Put a new boot on there and get it running for this fella. And that piston and top end looks fine. That's easy. See, I like problems like this. These are easy ones to fix, you know. This is actually the second one that's uh, tore out the same way. Actually from the same fella, believe it or not. Well, it's a week later. You know, time flies. I put up another CAD CAM rant and quickly took it down because I guess I got too close to the bone on a couple of subjects. Um, but the gist of the video was just drawn from past experience and mapping it on to uh, the observations I made while uh, Husqvarna developed a 562 into what I think is a great saw. Yeah. Really the gist of what I was, was saying is I'll paraphrase down even smaller so I have less chance of offending people, but it's going to get into the video. And it's just one of them deals where through years of, of being in that business, you sort of see trends and, and then when you see things happen, even if it's another industry, it kind of has a familiar feel, you know. Watching the, the, the 562s develop, it just had that very familiar feel to it so I made some commentary on that bottom line is is when you have those uh, you know really sophisticated CAD CAM systems get into solid modeling and some sophisticated 3d modeling right along with that is the ability of, of uh, wrapping your model with with uh, with a finite element mesh in what that's used to do Depending on your industry, it could be used for stress analysis, it could be used for, you know, heat transfer analysis, just a bunch of things you can get with that kind of a, of, a, of, of modeling and technology. And you got to believe that uh, Varna spent time doing, you know, all the above, but probably focused on heat analysis on, on those saws, because that whole design looks like it was meant to try to trap the heat coming out the exhaust port with the transfer is wrapping right around that to, to try to use that heat as a way of increasing efficiency. I don't know the thermodynamics of, of what they were doing. That's why they're engineers and I'm a hobbyist, you know what I'm saying? So I'm not going to second guess that. If you were to measure the heat from combustion, um, you, you can basically calculate that there's a certain amount of energy available then based on subtracting all the losses in the saw, there's going to be a certain amount of energy available at the, uh, on the business end of that crankshaft. And it's not going to be a 100% conversion between the actual energy contained within the fuel and what you get out the crank. It just doesn't happen, right? And that's just a given.
Um, if you look at turbochargers and things like that, that's exactly what they're about, is that's collecting heat energy and keeping it within the system so more of the energy total is, is used to uh, convert um, into, you know, the, the burning of the fuel into rotational energy. Well, I'm sure it's no different, and I'm sure the thermodynamics behind how they design the, the 562 and the, now the 572 is, is along those lines, getting as much efficiency out of the design as possible. So who are we to second guess engineers? That's what they do for a living. We sit back here and, and uh, speculate, you know what I'm saying? But what I do know is I understand that uh, interaction between engineers, CAD CAM systems, um, computer aided analysis systems down through the manufacturing process and then the feedback loop that most companies have from real world experience through customer support back into engineering to, to modify, update and uh, grow the product so it gets better and better and better over time. And that's really the story behind the 562 in my mind. When I look at that, it just fits into a, uh, it, it really just fits into a, a scenario that I've seen before, almost in an extreme way. Um, the gist of my video that I took down was recognizing that there's pressure to the engineering group to come up with a design and get it to market rapidly, but also they have to work around other things whether it's time to market or government regulations or manufacturing constraints based on the technology they have to replicate their parts, just all kinds of things. So it's a very hard thing to do and these guys have done a great job. That's the backdrop. But where I was going with that is two, there's two parts of the discussion. One, Husqvarna versus the rest of the saw world. Um, and this is going to be offensive to some people, and I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. They've taken these saws here, and yeah, the first iteration had teething issues. They grew in their experience set and got these saws to the point where they're solid saws. The fact of the matter is the 562 XP that you're going to buy uh, from your dealer now is a mature design. They've worked their way through a lot of design issues and statistically the first ones there was a whole percentage of them that worked just fine but there was enough that didn't that it hit online and people complained and then every time they would do an update a product update the design and that basic system got better and better and better to the point where it's fairly mature um, couple of things come to mind immediately first the, the, the basic design hasn't changed. They've evolved it. They've learned from the experiences in the customer base and they've grown the saw. Um, and the thing that I find interesting, again, from an old software guy, is what they've done is they've got a, a basic concept that works. And even a lot of the upgrades that are coming out, say 2016, like the cut covers, piston, and uh, you know the different mapping in the... In the um, ignition and carb. A lot of that can retro back to the first 2012. And for that matter, Husqvarna being responsible the way they are, uh, they had a period of time where they had these really cheap uh, six screw cases so it was easy for a dealer that had an old five screw uh, case saw that had some issues to cheaply and quickly bring it up to you know a more um, you know a, a more reliable specification. And you got to give kudos to a company that's willing to support their their product line that bad. So I don't see that as a negative. I see that as a company that's actually supporting their customer base and supporting their product. Um, if you're an aficionado of another brand, of course you want to call that a problem. And one of the things that one of my best friends reminds me from time to time is at least these saws, the basic layout and the concept, and the interchangeability of parts has been consistent for, through the life of the saw to this point in time. And the other guys can't say that. And the second part of the discussion is just the interaction between design groups and the CAD CAM tools themselves. And this is not targeted towards Husqvarna, Steel, or anyone else. It's just uh, kind of a, a generic statement. And 
so I will say these companies, these style companies, when they have this sophisticated a product, uh, end up buying rather sophisticated CAD CAM systems to go along with it. You know what I'm saying? Because they have to have those design tools to rapidly come up with a, a design such as that. And there's a lot of geometry in that, and the intersection of that geometry is pretty critical to the tolerance stack. And being able to first model it and then replicate it, you, you know, it, it's, it's not easy. And it takes some of the more sophisticated tools that are on the market today to make that something that's even cost effective. I can't imagine designing and building that saw with an with a engineering group that's based on you know, boards and slide rules and pens and pencils. It really has to be done with the CAD CAM. And some of your clues is like the interference issues you have if you try to modify one of these. That's another whole subject in of itself. The guys who just went out and tried to do, tried to do base gasket leaks and then dropping cylinders. and You, you could see online this litany of, of, uh, of issues they ran into and they would blame it on interference between um, transfer caps and the cases and all that, and they would try to make that like it's a Husqvarna problem. No, it's actually a Husqvarna plus because they were able to make and replicate a saw to those tolerances. The problem is with the guys who want to modify these damn things who simply don't get a design that, that you know, that's that sophisticated and basically ruin a lot of good saws. A couple of the interference issues you're going to run into if you try to drop that cylinder is the transfer caps to the cases, the flange to the cases, and one that's not very uh, obvious to a lot, but it should be, is when you crank that muffler down, it's going to try to jack the cylinder up some, because when you move the whole cylinder down, you're moving that muffler down as well, and the, the screw to the muffler interference is pretty tight. So there are cases where when you've moved that cylinder down as much as some of these guys think that they're doing or brag that they do, they've pushed that muffler to the point where you have to modify the holes. Otherwise, when you crank it down, you're going to jack the front of that cylinder up. And I can tell you there's more than a few that can't figure how come that they got these leaks and the transfers, you know, at the front of the motor and they blame it on the Husqvarna design. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with they don't understand um, the geometry they're, they're messing with. You know what I'm saying? Um, my recommendation is just run them. They're a great saw. But back to the CAD CAM thing. So what happens is you've got these wonderful tools that can model this, these really complex shapes. And the, the geometry base of these systems might be a surface modeling base or a solid modeling base or some hybrid where you can uh, tie geometry together around a solid modeling data structure of some type. And there's all different kinds of CAD systems. And I'm being obtuse because I don't want to pick on any one brand or by saying the precise style of, of modeling and data uh, uh, storage I've identified a particular CAD system. So you've got this marketing pressure, you've got these really sophisticated tools that re require a lot of skill to be able to use and manipulate properly and trust me I know this because I used to train people and how to use it and had some very bright people struggle because of all the different permutations and approaches you can take to using those new design tools. You've got the analysis tools and all this stuff comes together and you end up with, with a 562. The engineer by nature is going to rely on the software tools because that's where he's sitting next to. And it's a lot cheaper doing that than actually build, building a bunch of prototype physical models because you've got to build the tooling to, to build the damn things to send them out into the field, wait for results to come back. That's a very long uh, cycle. So a lot of these people will depend more and more on trying to simulate on their systems in cyberspace what's going to happen when that system hits the field. So you get this combination of experience of using the system to design these things, using the CAD system to do analysis, um, building prototypes and getting information back into the field to start updating the design, and then when you get to a critical mass where you think that thing is ready to go, it hits the marketplace. And here's, here's where the blessing and curse comes in. The blessing is they were able to get there to the point where they had a, a useful enough product that can be sold. The curse is because you have to depend on those tools. Um, you also have to depend on the, 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 uh, the compromises because it's almost impossible 
to anticipate all the special conditions a product like this is going to have when it gets out into the field and you have all these people using them in all different climates, different fuels, all this stuff. And yeah, they may try to come up with the worst case scenarios and, and test for that. But you're just not going to. I mean, it's just, I think it's statistically impossible. I know, for example, a software, it is impossible. So it's not a surprise. Combination of using the very sophisticated tools, and there's a learning curve with that, um, relying on cyberspace to do some of the modeling, but also some of the uh, things like heat transfer analysis, and yeah, having some beta, doing the best you can, but also the marketing pressure to get that thing out there and get some money, you know, get it sold, get get money coming into the into the uh, company so they can go back and fund the next level of research and the next level of pop product evolution. So all these things pressure these guys and they come up with the design hits the marketplace and it has issues and with, with the, the 562 the first five screw cases there was a few well documented issues one was a percentage of them not all of them a percentage of them would leak underneath the muffler and there was other issues and some of them had low speed and hot start issues then they go back and they now they're better at running the tools, they're better at understanding the analysis, and along with the real-time data they're getting from the field, they come up with updates to try to keep the system to where it's it's more and more statistically reliable. And which goes back to my first point, they were able to do that to the point where they didn't have to redesign the whole saw. They were able to make updates. They come up with a different piston, they had the different cases, the six screw cases. Uh, the different carburetors, they come up with a different cover. This is all an evolution as they evolve that product to, to a better state to the point where I don't usually see, you know, I don't see uh, the later model 562s come back very often at all. Now, just because somewhere around 2015 16 they got to the point where there's, you know, small enough uh, statistical issues that they're reliable. doesn't mean Husqvarna is going to stop developing the saw. It's not how they've operated in the past. Why would they do that in the, in the future? So this is another fork in the road in the discussion. First, because of the experience with the saws and the 550s as well, now you have an engineering group that's um, quite a bit experienced and they've got a lot of real knowledge on top of the theoretical on how these things react. And you, you got to believe that these are smart folks. So that affects everything. It affects how they, they um, interpret the models. It's how they interpret the analysis. And they start understanding the system. They start seeing the areas. And they start seeing that reflected in the models. And they get better and better and better at debugging little issues should they come up in the field to the point where statistically it's small enough that there's there it doesn't matter anymore and I think they pretty much got there with these next subject the new designs like the 572 they've got that whole body of knowledge now of growing not just their design tools but also this product line for the last few years and now they're going to come out with a with really essentially a bigger version of this style saw you got to believe that that saw is going to have a whole lot less issues when it hits the marketplace just because they have all this experience, um, not just with this saw in the field, but also their design tools, their analysis tools, that they can predict and come up with solutions um, before that saw hits the marketplace so that when the 572 gets to the marketplace, it does with the experience and uh, the maturity that the group had growing this 562. The next step of that is, as the 562 continues in its, its service life, the things that they've designed and, and put into the 572, they'll kind of come back into the 562. My hunch is they're talking about that uh, heat partition up there for the carburetor in the 572. Uh, you want to bet that that'll eventually end up in the 562, 550 series? Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but my bet is it will. The thing that Husky learned over time was how to make these things reliable. And you gotta believe when they got a clean sheet, they're gonna roll that knowledge into that next, you know, that next product line. And the second thing is they have more experience with that whole system, whether it's the 
uh, the cylinder design, transfer design, muffler design, ignition, their auto-tune deal, which actually is pretty clever. Um, they've, they've lived with it, they've worked with it, they've made it reliable, they understand it. So the 572 design is being done with all that background, and that's huge. That means the chances of hitting it right the first time are much higher than somebody who comes up with a new widget that hasn't gone through that whole evolution process, both the design modeling, then through the, um, you know, the product life in the field, the, just that whole maturation process that these things have gone through. I can't say the future. There's a guy who says he can, but I can't. Um, but just based on watching this stuff over a bunch of years in a bunch of industries, I just happen to believe that Husqvarna is, is, a, is really ahead of the curve in this, in this style of technology. This is complex stuff. This is not just kitchen sinks, you know what I'm saying? This is really complex stuff. There's a lot of physics happening in that, in that motor. And because of that, the blessing, as I said before, is that the CAD CAM tools of today help them see what's going on, at least get an idea of what's going on. And that's the key, is when you first do these models and first do the analysis on these models, you're getting an idea, but you're not getting gospel. You're getting something that's going to give you a clue as to how things will go, but you're not going to get precise numbers until you get that feedback loop going from the real physical object. But anyway, I pulled the other video because I got some really fast blowback on that one. And I, I kind of came to the conclusion that I can be less precise and say the same damn thing. And to be perfectly blunt, I don't care if people get upset about it. It's not about the brands. It's about the technology. It's about the interaction between... CAD CAM technology and design organizations. It's about design organizations, CAD systems, and marketing organizations trying to wrestle their way into the marketplace. And it's a great story. It's been played many, many years, many, many times. And the 562 is one that I think has, has been a successful story. It had a rocky start, but they've come into their own. And um, to discount that background that Husqvarna has, in this style of saw is just being naive. Conversely, the other brands who think they're going to jump right to this level of, of maturity on a brand new um, design concept, I think that's naive too. So, in summary, I'm really looking forward to the 572. I'm going to lament the loss of the 576 if the rumors are true, because I like that saw as well. And I still stand by the CAD CAM thing being a, both a blessing and a curse. And I guess the trap that I had seen in, in years and what I was highlighting in my first video is because, you know, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You get people who are, who are really used to working with that tool. That's what they do every day. And there's a lot that has to be done. A lot more of the design and the analysis of the design happens in cyberspace because it's, it's easier to do. And the trap is you can almost depend on it too much. And that's the curse. It takes a lot of effort to make it right. Um, you get vested interest in the models and the analysis models that you're coming up with. An engineering group can tend to depend on that a little bit too much until warranty reality bumps them out of that bubble and they have to go back to some of the basics again. And I don't care who they are, the people, you know. And, you know, people accused Husky of hitting that too soon to the marketplace. I don't see that at all. I don't see any way it could have been any different just because of the nature of chainsaws and the design constraints that they were having to deal with. I think they did a good job, and I said that in a, my first CAD CAM video. So anyway, I don't know if I'm going to post this or not, um, but basically that's a very quick synopsis of my first and second CAD CAM video where CAD CAM is a blessing and a curse. The blessing is you can model. You can get these really tight, models and do interference checks and, and uh, do very space efficient and weight efficient designs and you can also do analysis and all these things that you have with the newer uh, CAD CAM type products that a company like Husqvarna can afford to have. The curse is you can depend on them too much. One thing I am seeing on this saw is I don't like whatever I don't like whatever he's using for two-stroke oil. There's kind of like this brown film in here, and I find the bearings are just a little bit sticky. Once you break them loose, they get loose again. But there's 
there's a residual in here that's not oily. I don't know what it is. So I'm going to have to find out what it is he's using for, for a, a lubricant in these saws and try to get him to change. See it, but you're getting a lot of carbon residue in the exhaust. When I open up my saws after a bunch of use like this, I always see a nice blue oil film. You know, the Husqvarna XP oil. I use this stuff pretty much in all my two strokes now. Fuel line, pulse line, throttle cable, get it on there. I was fortunate enough to go to one of the Husqvarna training courses. And it was basically an introduction to common service tool and the auto-tune technology. And I, I thought it was well done. I mean, I liked it. Guys are enthusiastic. You know, it's a work in progress for them trying to come up with people to be able to articulate the technology, you know. But you know what the hardest part is, I think, for Husqvarna on those training courses? And I know there's somebody who's going to get mad at me for saying this. But I don't care how good you are as a trainer. They're sitting in front of business owners. And the business owners, some of them have been in that business for a long time. And a guy who comes on board to train them is going to really have a hard time because any person who has the guts and the mojo to go off and take a bunch of money and risk it all to start a business has is, is got some pride, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and uh, it's going to be really hard for a a corporate person, number one, to, to gain that respect unless they really know their stuff. Um, but a hired teacher has even a harder time unless they came out of that very same world. And, uh, and the second part of it is this. By the way, you don't want to go too tight on these things. The common service tool is not really that hard, you know. Um... But there's going to be a natural resistance to that kind of technology from folks that have spent their entire time, you know, twisting wrenches. It, it's really just a natural. It's just the way it's going to be. It's not going to change. And so now you, you have both those forces at work, and then the trainer has to come up with a course to take some of these really proud people and get them to first listen, second to transition from that mechanical tactile experience set to the begin to trust some of the stuff that you're going to see in the in common service tool. I happen to like it. I think it's pretty cool. And the course we went to and uh, Bob was was very much instrumental in letting that happen for me. To him, I say thank you. But it was designed to be an introduction. It wasn't designed as much to be a uh, course for the, the people who've already been there and got a lot of expertise. It was designed to get people into it, and they figured through the hotline and and other communication media they can help bring people along once they get into the damn thing, you know. And the, the experienced guy who's been there for a while might come away saying, you know something, I, that was a waste of my time. To which I'm going to say, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Because the people who were there were open to questions, should you ask them. But you got to ask them. And a couple of people there have got a fair amount of experience in the customer service side of the Husqvarna organization. Have seen an awful lot of stuff themselves. It's not like... Uh, the people who have a dealer, the only people on the planet have seen, you know, chainsaw issues and have to solve them. The guys at the service de department at Husqvarna have done the same thing. That's what they do for a living. So, of course there's experience to share and learn. But what I'd like to see over time in, uh, this goes back again to my CAD cam roots. I don't know why I keep going back there. 
but going back to my roots, we used to do seminars. Some of them required the customer to fork out some money. Some of them didn't. And what they were about was having us as customer service people who deal with a whole bunch of dealers, or in our, my case, a whole bunch of customers. I might see 50 customers, each one of them, you know, with their unique experience and a knowledge set, each one of them being an expert. We were able to bring that to the table and sit down and start out with an agenda. We said, okay, this is our training course. We want to cover this today. But our real agenda in the training course wasn't to cover that. Our real agenda in those training courses was to get our customers to come back with issues that we could help them solve, have the other people in the seminar see those same issues and how we solve them together. They walk away with that background. We walk away with more uh, real-world data that we can bring back to our you know, our uh, organization for product design. And this could work with the Husqvarna really well, especially with a common service tool. Everybody wins. And it's not just a lecture, it's an interactive course. And it's something you couldn't do with an introductory. You have to have it where a person's been in there for a while. So I think the course was, was designed for you know, introduction to, to the concept. And I think for what it was designed to do, I think it was excellent. And there's another area. Um, they, they, they had like a few samples and basically they were trying to get you to kind of look at the numbers you're getting for um, both error codes, but also the last setting for the, the carburetor that the Autotune tried to get to as a clue to help diagnose a saw. And that concept is, is really important because it really is not just, you know, press a button, hit a, it tells you exactly what's wrong with your saw. It gives you clues, but it gives you two sets of clues. Three sets of clues, I guess, if you want to get more particular. You get your error code if, it, you know, if it's having a problem. That's a clue, you know, and then they have a little manual that tells you what the error code uh, points to as possible causes. The last setting on the carburetor tells you what auto-tune was trying to do, whether it was trying to lean things out or richen them up, both high and low. That's a clue. Also, there's uh, the running history that whether you, um, this thing happened two starts ago or a hundred starts ago. And also, is this saw one that idles a lot? Or does it run flat out a lot? Is it a hard use saw? You have clues in that system that you have to build uh, a model of what's going on with that saw in your mind. It's not going to come from a common service tool. And I guess the message here is you still got to be a mechanic. You still have to understand two-stroke basics. Um, that part of, of the common service tool relative to saws, they don't have time to cover that in the first course. They just did it briefly. And I'm hoping what happened is people walked away just sort of getting that sense of, yeah, with well, this kind of information, you can intuit into um, the kind of problems your saw is experiencing based on what it's trying to tell you and shorten your, your diagnosis time as a result. For me, it's, it can save me hours. Especially if you walk into a problem thinking you know what the answer is. Common service tool, numbers don't lie, and can get you back on track in a hurry if you're opening your mind and opening your heart to paying attention to what it is they're telling you. So I, I thought it was a good course. I'm a fan of common service tool. And who the hell am I to even have that kind of an opinion? But I do. Got a big mouth. Function test the choke, fuel line, pulse line, choke lever, uh, anti vibe mount. It's all attached. Attached. Let me just check the. That's all I want. I don't want any more. Yep.